Okay, so today is Tuesday, February 27, and I think we've now covered three of Mr. Zilke's slides across the last three or four days of lectures. Does that sound about right? But fortunately, you took notes the whole time, so you have like 17 pages of notes. Okay, Andy's checking his head. Oh, yeah, I got 17 pages. Is that right, Andy? You can, you can lie to me and say yes. Okay, what are you lying to me for, Andy? I know you didn't take seven pages of notes. Seven pages? Seven sentences? Around that, around that. Okay, all right. All right, so let's do a slide. Constant current. All right, you can charge batteries two different ways. The way we charge them, the best way to charge them when they're outside of the aircraft is what's, what's called a constant current charger. That means it's a charger with a little computer in it, and it's measuring how many amps it's trying to pump into the battery, and it keeps those amps the same. So if it's charging it at two amps, it's going to vary the voltage, keep shoving in two amps all the time as the battery gets to a higher voltage. So, so let's back up, I guess, a little bit. So let's start with this score. I know somebody's name. So Andrew, in a 28-volt system, how, what is the voltage that the alternator or generator puts out when it's working correctly? 28 volts. Okay. So, if the alternator is putting out, setting up 28 volts, um, how does the, well, it's like Jocelyn. She, you already answered a correct question. So, Jocelyn, in a 28 volt system, what's the voltage of a brand new battery in that system, fully charged? It's 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but nothing's hooked up to it, discharging it in a 28 volt system. 25.2. Okay, excellent. James, so now here's the, the question of the moment is how does the system when the battery is, is has you've discharged it a lot because you cranked the engine a whole bunch, how does it know to charge the battery? But then after five minutes when the battery's charged, how does it know to only charge it a little? It's okay if you don't know the answer. Did somebody just come? Go ahead. I'm sorry? It's harder to put electrons in the battery. Can you, uh, Kyle? There's somebody else's name I know. Kyle, can you to explain what James said? He said that as the battery gets charged, it's harder to put electrons into the battery. That's true. Can you, you say that in different words? the battery voltage goes up. So when you charge a lead acid battery, as it gets more charge and it's fuller, the voltage goes up. Okay, Jacob. So can you continue with that? So how does the, in a, once the engine's running, the alternator's on in an aircraft, as the voltage of the battery goes up, how does less amps get pumped into the battery? The battery's getting a higher voltage because it's getting fuller. Nobody ever asked you this question before, right? Okay. Yeah, please. It's exactly like a car system. The voltage regulator. Okay, so Peter, you have a lot of experience with voltage regulators. Yeah. Okay, then you're not going to be able to answer the question that I'm going to ask you. Yeah, you will. I'll ask you a different question. In aircraft electrical systems, these DC electrical systems, once you get the engine running and the alternator is turned on, what's the voltage? If you hooked a voltmeter up to the ground and to the bus bar, what voltage would you read? It, I'll give you a hint. It's a 28-volt system. The alternator puts out 28 volts, and the battery, if it's fully charged, brand new, at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and you haven't charged it or discharged it lately, it's going to read 25.2. The alternator is running. How, Go ahead and pull out that diagram that you drew yesterday that I put on the screen. How many volts will the alternator put out and, and apply to the system in a 28-volt system? Don't anybody? Let's give Peter a chance. He's going to look at his notes. 
Well, what's what's that? What's at twenty five point two? Is that the battery or the alternator? The battery. Okay. How much is the alternator putting out? Twenty eight. So, Javier, man, I'm on a roll. So, Javier, explain to the class why is the battery voltage twenty five point two, but the alternator puts out a higher voltage? Why does the alternator? The alternator is recharging the battery, I agree. Why does the voltage being put out by the alternator need to be higher than the battery? What would happen if the alternator was at 24 volts, the battery with the 20 charge? Okay, so we need what out of the alternator to be able to charge the battery? Higher. No, it's not amps. Try again. Voltage. Okay, so we need the alternator to be a higher voltage than the battery. So, Rodney, why does why do we need the alternator to be a higher voltage than the battery if we want to charge the battery? The alternator has to overcome the internal resistance of the battery. That is an accurate statement, but I don't want to fiddle around with this all internal resistance crap because I'm an airplane. I'm going to fix it. But I do have enough to be able to fix it. So, Andy, I've only harassed you once today, so it's your turn again. So, if, well, oh, pardon me. Sorry, I walked backwards. There was somebody that came in about five minutes. Sorry, is, are you Zach? And who just came in? Scott? Hey, Jonah, what's that? You remember the 1990s? Did you watch Budweiser beer commercials at the Super Bowl in the 90s? You did? You were like, you were like 17 years old in the 90s? All right. I'm telling you, if I was writing your test, I would tell you, guaranteed, no matter what, you're going to get a diagram that looks just like this. It just won't be labeled, and you'll have to tell me everything about it. So, I can't remember. I asked you, do you remember what question I asked you about three minutes ago, Andy? I was just about to. Okay, all right. So, thanks for putting yourself up there ready to get uh, abused. Well, I can't abuse you. That's against the rules. I, I can academically challenge you. There, that's it. That's what I can do. So, um, what do you think? And if this is a 28, look, looking at the bus bar, how many volts is this battery if it's brand new, fully charged, and we haven't discharged it or, de or charged it lately? The battery? Point. Sorry. No, go the other way. Okay, all right. And how much does the alternator put out if everything's working correctly and it's running? All right. So, under normal circumstances, Andy, let's say we haven't started the engine up yet, so the alternator's not working. Which way do the, ba the electrons leave the battery? Do they come out of the negative side and go in that direction, or do they come out the positive side and go in that direction? They, they do what? They 
come out of the negative side and go towards the the positive. Yeah, so electrons are going to go like this. All right, so Eric, right? So Eric, what's going to be happening to the battery if we don't turn on the alternator, but we turn on our stuff? We turn on the landing light, we turn on, we, we try to crank the, uh, the motor to start the engine, but the alternator, alternator never gets on. What's happening to the battery? Nothing? So it's going to sit there at 25.2 volts all day long, even though we got the landing lights turned on and the stereo on and the hot tub. Your laugh, hot tub, you never seen a hot tub in a business jet? Yeah, me neither. The water would slosh around too much in the turbulence. Well, the battery's going to sit there, but something's going to happen to it. If it's discharging, what's going to happen to its voltage? It's going to go down. Okay. All right. It's going to go down while it's discharging. So, Eric. Is that like two Eric's in a row? Okay. All right. Eric, who's not in a row. If we get the altar up and running... Everything's working correct, correct. We turn on our stuff and we turn on even more stuff. Now, what component in this system is providing power to this stuff and more stuff? Everything's up and running. The battery's connected, the alternator's up and running, the engine is spinning, everything's working correctly. Where do the electrons come from that go through this stuff and go through the more stuff? You got two choices? The what? Well, they ought, they have they, the alternator produces power and the battery has stored power. Which of these two components has a higher voltage? The alternator. In an electrical system like this, if you have more than one device that can provide electrical power, which one provides all the electrical power? It's always, huh? As long as the alternator is, is what? working correctly, which means it puts out a voltage of, which is higher than the battery. Okay, Luis, Al, is there another Luis? Did we have another Luis last semester? Okay, so I can just call you Luis remaining. Luis, in a system that has two different power sources, which one will produce, the, which one will the electrons come from to power all of our stuff? In this circuit, the alternator is up and running, the engines are spinning. The alternator, why will the alternator provide power to the stuff instead of the battery? Because it has a higher voltage. Okay, William. So this is the trick question from yesterday. If the alternator is up and running and it's producing 28 volts and the battery is getting charged, electrons are leaving the alternator and electrons are going in this direction to power the stuff and the more stuff. Tell me about electron flow in the battery or to the battery while the battery is getting charged. Yeah, the engine's running, the alternator is working. Let me back up. Before we start the engine, is the alternator going to spin? Okay, so can the alternator produce any power? Okay, so what can provide power in this system when the engine's not running? Right, so the battery. So which way do the electrons leave the battery when the battery is discharging? They come out of what side of the battery? They come out of the negative and they end up going into the positive. So these, these black, so this isn't working, that's not right here. Now we start the engine. We turn on the alternator. Which has a higher voltage, the battery or the alternator? So which is going to produce the power to power everything in the system? Because it has more voltage. All right. So now, tell me what's going, we're going to charge the battery now because the alternator has a higher voltage than the battery. Tell me about where are electrons coming out of the battery and where are the electrons going into the battery while it's being charged. 
Is, are they coming out of the positive or going into the positive? Well, they're going into the positive right here when the battery is getting discharged. So are you saying that when the battery is getting charged, the electrons keep going in the same direction in the battery? Okay. So if this is the direction of electron flow when the battery is getting charged, what's the direction of electron flow when the battery is getting discharged? I mean, is charged, is charged. I'll give you a hint. When we're discharging it, the electrons are going in what direction? They come out of where? They come out of negative. So the electrons come out of the negative, they go through our stuff, and they come back into the positive. So that's when the battery's getting discharged. So what do you think is going on if we're going to charge the battery? They're going to what? They're going to go the other way. So when we're charging the battery, the electrons come out of the alternator and shove electrons back in. They pull them off of the battery and they shove them back in. So there's more negative electrons here and positive means there's more places there are not enough electrons. Did I lose anybody? Is there anything you've heard in the last you forgot from yesterday? Remain seated if, if we covered something today that you forgot from yesterday. Okay, all right. So for most people, it was well spent. Elizabeth's just sitting there going, yep, 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 yep. Anybody ever seen that on Sesame Street with the aliens with the kind of horn mouths? And they all go, yep, 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 yep. You're not, you're not the Sesame Street generation? Nope, 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 nope. Uh, all right, fine. Don't laugh at my silly jokes. All right, believe it or not. Okay. Now, I know what's going through your mind. You're like going, Mr. Johnson, I don't get it. When the battery's discharging, electrons go in one direction. When they're charging, they go in the other direction. How does that, how does, what's controlling to make happen? Somebody over in the f far row over there says something about a voltage regulator. So before I tell you about voltage regulator, you are going to find that when you talk to automobile mechanics and you talk to airplane mechanics, what the hardest thing people have to do in their career is not unscrew nuts and bolts and screw them back together. And it's not looking things up in maintenance manuals and doing it correctly. And it's not doing the paperwork. Liz, let's see. You're up, Oscar. What's the hardest thing about being a professional mechanic? Not messing up. Okay. All right. Um, I agree that, that's, that you have to pay very close attention and not mess up. John, you've been a professional uh, maintenance mechanic in the United States military, yes? Nah. You weren't, you weren't that professional about it? Okay. So, but you have a lot of experience, right? Generally speaking? All right. Well, then you won't know the answer to the question. What's the hardest thing to do as a mechanic? <laughs> okay. If we put aside our, your and my pers per personal issues. your equipment. Yeah, so as mechanics, we're going to have to deal with pilots. We forgive them uh, for breaking things. I think there's a saying I read this book that said, uh, oh, this said, oh, he said, uh, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So as a mechanic, thank you for laughing around. So as a mechanic, you got to say that to yourself. You want to give it a try? Pilot, I forgive you. What's the hardest thing about being a mechanic? Nah. You can have a cheat sheet for that. Okay, go ahead. Friedrich. Diagnosing issues. Can anybody think of another name besides diagnosing? Troubleshooting. Troubleshooting. Yes, excellent. So is that an issue for you? No, because you can figure out everything all the time. Yeah, you're so full of baloney. See how I said baloney? I, I'm not going to argue about the excellence of teachers. I'm going to tell you that for me... 
troubleshooting or diagnosing is the hardest thing, in particular when I'm trying to figure out a system that I've never done any troubleshooting on before. So one of those things, and there are several things, one of those things you need to do to be a good troubleshooter, to be a good diagnostician, you do not have to spell diagnostician, although I'm sure <coughs> Friedrich could, uh, if you're, I can't say your name right, I'm, sh I'm sure he, won he could spell it. In order to be a good diagnostician, in order to be a good troubleshooter, you have to understand how everything is supposed to work when it's normal. Otherwise, when it doesn't work, you won't recognize what's working well, and you won't recognize what's working badly. So I'm not running you through this because I know a lot about this. I'm running you through this because you've got to know what does it look like when it's normal, and what does it look like, what's, so therefore when you see something that doesn't look normal, that'll give you a clue. Okay, now I'm going to go back. If you talk to car mechanics and you talk to air, aircraft mechanics, commonly, for everybody it's different, but commonly they're going to say that electrical troubleshooting is one of the hardest things they ever do. And, of course, electricity, you can't see it very well. It's not like hydraulic fluid. I think I covered that last week. You can't see electricity dripping out of the plane down on the ground. Well, you can isolate it, but you can't see it. And sometimes it's not intuitive. If water, we're, how many people have ever once turned on a water faucet and washed their face? Okay, nearly a third of the class knows how to wash their face. All right, great. We're used to water, so trying to understand a hydraulic system isn't too bad, or a pneumatic system, but electricity doesn't quite work like water does. It's not intuitive. As a human being, we haven't experienced electricity a lot. Although I recall, or my mom tells me this story, I don't personally remember it, but she's told me so often I can just imagine it occurring. She said, when I was three, I picked up a bobby pin, a hairpin, and I stuck it in the wall outlet, and it zapped me, and I got thrown back a foot or two. And then I picked it up and walked over and stuck it in the outlet a second time. You know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what was going through my mind. That was, that was, that was 74 years ago. So I don't know what was going through. I don't remember what was going through my mind. But maybe one of them is I wanted to confirm: Does this, ha is this just a one-time occurrence, or is this going to happen every time I stick a, a wire into the outlet? You got to remember, this is before they had those little plastic things you stuck in there that your kids, when they turned three, learned how to pull them out and chew on them and swallow them and choke on them. So the world was a different place back then. It was okay for your kids to test electricity the hard way. Now, huh? Sometimes you need to shed some brain cells so some others can grow. That's, there's actually studies about, about that. Uh, teenagers kill off brains. And when you're in your teenage years, brain, brain cells die off, some of them. And, 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 you get, and you get some that work really better. But that's a long story. We're not going to go into neuroscience of the teenager today. We'll save that for tomorrow in case the judge doesn't let Mr. Zilke out. So I'm going to add one more component into this. Because we're not quite finished with everything we need to know about what's in this system. The last thing in here is the voltage regulator. So you'll notice the voltage regulator is connected to the bus bar and it's connected to ground and it's got one more wire it's going to the alternator. What the voltage regulator, so, so some, let's see. I was I wasn't done harassing people. Let's see. Well, I've harassed. Okay, we're up to we're up to uh, Zach. Good morning, Zach. So, Zach, in uh, an automobile or uh, an aircraft, we'll we'll get crazy here and we'll say it's it's an old school small aircraft. It's a 14 volt system. The concepts are identical, then only the numbers have changed to protect it. In a 14 volt system. If 
and running, the alternator is running, you turn a few things on here and there. If you had a voltmeter on the system connected between the bus bar and the ground, what would your voltmeter read? The engine is running, the alternator is spinning, and everything is working correctly. Just for fun, what's the battery voltage in a 14 volts slash 12 volts? Go in the other direction. How many volts are in one cell of a lead acid battery? Oh, you want to help him out? 2.1 volts. Okay, Zach, how many cells are in a 12 volt battery? Have you ever touched a 12 volt battery? Have you ever put one next to your nightstand at night so when you wake up in the middle of the night you could see and go, yeah, that's a 12 volt battery. Do you put anything on your nightstand at night so when you wake up and you look at, oh, don't tell me, don't tell me. is on a brand new fully charged lead acid battery that's got six cells it's at 80 and you haven't charged it or discharged it lately it's tough get out your calculator what's 2.1 times 6 a 12 volt battery there are six cells in it each cell puts out 2.1 volts so 2.1 times 6 equals I know this is tough 2.1 times 6 you ever do math 12.6. All right, so the battery, brand new, fully charged, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We haven't charged it or discharged it in a while. It's 12.6 volts. So what do you think the alternator is going to have to put out to be able to charge the battery after it gets up and running? We start the engine. We turn on the alternator. Everything's working correctly. How many volts does the alternator need to put out so it can charge the battery? More than that. Opal, you want to help him out? 14 volts. So if you don't recall, if you look at the numbers I had up there before, 25.2 and 28, these numbers are exactly half. In a 28 volt system, there's 12 cells, so we get 25.2. And 25.2 is exactly double the 12.6. So we're not going to worry about that. Okay, Zach. So, just for fun, when the alternator's up and running, I'm going to tell... I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a secret. The voltage regulator in the aircraft, not the battery charger on the ground, but the voltage regulator in the aircraft, it's done what it's saying. If, you were, if I was to write a test and I said, what does the voltage regulator do? And you wrote the words, it regulates voltage, you would get no credit on my test. But don't be afraid, because I'm not writing your test. So, can, so voltage regulation means that the voltage stays the same. The voltage doesn't change. If we don't turn on too many things and the alternator can handle it, every time we put the voltmeter on there, it's going to read how many volts if everything's working, Zach? The alternator's working. 14 volts, that's correct. So just for fun, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say, you know what, I'm just going to stick a voltmeter in the circuit. So I'm going to put one to ground, that's the aluminum, and I'm going to put the other one on the bus bar. Or I could even go over here and put it on this side of the battery, or I could even connect it to this side of the alternator, because all of these things are somehow connected to the bus bar. All right, so you, thank you, Opal, for the last couple of helps there. So uh, Richard, I'm sorry to interrupt you taking notes. In this system, if, let's just say for fun, you're an expert on alternators, yes? No? Okay, excellent. So let's say that your alternator will put out 60 amps. That's what it's designed to do. And let's say that uh, we turn on this stuff over here, and it's, it's 30, if it'll let me, this is 30 amps, and this is 20 amps. So what's 30 plus 20, Richard? I know this is tough. Get out your calculator. 50, all right. 
Do you think the alternator can push enough electrons to power both of these two things? Yeah, okay. What if we just engine and the battery takes 10 amps just for that first few minutes? How many amps is the alternator putting out? 60. And how many amps is the alternator going to have to try to put out? 60. In this case, 20 plus 30 plus 10. So as long as everything hooked up to the alternator isn't drawing or pulling more than what the alternator can put out, our voltmeter will sit there and it'll be stuck right smack at 14 volts. Let's say we let the engine run for five minutes. It comes down to one or two amps. And that's the normal place for this kind of ammeter. It'll say one to two amps. So let's just say for fun that it's two amps. So under this condition here, Richard, how many amps is the alternator going to have to put out in order to maintain 14 volts? Which tell, name which three components are using electrical power right now? Where, what three components is the alternator pumping amps into? Stuff, more stuff, and what? And the battery. Okay. All right, Elizabeth, it's your turn. So under this circumstance here, the battery's taking two amps because it's charged. We got more stuff taking 30 amps. Uh, correction, stuff is taking 30 amps, and more stuff is taking 20. So how many amps is the alternator generating right now if everything's working correctly? It's generating about, it's generating about 52. In this case, it's not only amps through stuff and pushing more stuff, it's actually charging the battery. So now, Elizabeth, I decide I'm going to turn on even, I'm going to put on, turn on extra stuff. I'm going to turn on the jacuzzi pump. We'll just call it J, J A C, jacuzzi. Oh, we'll put some Z's in there. All right. Let's just say for fun that this takes 10 amps. So now, Elizabeth, how many amps is the alternator going to try to put out? Try to put out 62. Right. But it can't, so the battery's going to start That's exactly right. If the alternator can only put out 60 amps, but we hook up a bunch of stuff that takes 62 amps, where does that other 2 amps come from? The alternator puts out 60, where's that 2? The battery won't get charged anymore. In fact, we could make this way more easy, more interesting. We'll say that this thing takes 20 amps. So 20 amps plus 30 amps from the stuff plus 20 amps. That right there is 70 amps. So I want you to think this system like this. Pretend it's your house. You're running through the house. Let's say you've got a pressure gauge on the water inside the house. Not what's coming to the house, but on the inside of the house. You start walking through the house and you turn on one faucet, you turn on another faucet. You turn on the shower, you start, you uh, flush all the toilets. If you got a day, you, put, you push on that handle and stick a rock on top of it so it'll keep running. If you don't know what a bidet is, look it up on the internet. And it's just a cleaning device. That's all it is that uses water. And then you run around outside and you turn on all the outside water faucets. Generally speaking, as you turn on more stuff, what happens to the water pressure inside your house? The water pressure goes down. So that's the same in this system. If you turn on stuff, the pressure goes down, the voltage goes down. In your house, though, there's one pipe coming into your house, and that's all you get. So if you keep turning on more and more and more stuff, the pressure's going to go down. In this system, we got one pipe, and that's the battery, but we got another pipe hooked to the system, and that's the alternator. So when you run through your house turning on the water and the pressure goes down, that pipe, somebody sitting there looking at the water pressure gauge, whenever you turn more stuff on, it opens that pipe up and more water comes into your house and the pressure comes back up. 
That's what the voltage regulator is doing. It's measuring the voltage. It's measuring the water pressure in your house. And every time the pressure goes down, it allows more water to come in your house. And it bring, with that added volume of water, the pressure comes back up to whatever it was. We'll say 50 PSI. So that voltage regulator, it's a lot faster than a human. You can actually put a little gizmo right there, and it measures your house pressure. And every time you extra water comes in, and when you turn stuff off, it reduces it. So that's what the voltage regulator is doing. And as the pressure goes down because you turn on too much stuff, it'll tell the alternator, put out more stuff. The opposite is true. When you turn things off, let's say you've got this one water pipe coming into your house. You've got all the water faucets turned on. And let's say the water pressure is at 40 PSI. And you get five people together, and all of a sudden you run through the house and you turn the water faucets off spontaneously. What's going to happen to the water pressure in your house? Pressure is going to go up. Okay, so the regulator in this system is also going to say, hey, the pressure's too high. So that voltage regulator will tell the alternator to put it. So literally every time you're in the aircraft or in your car and you turn something electrical on, the voltage is going to go down a little. The voltage regulator says, whoa, the voltage went down a little. And it's going to tell the alternator, hey, pump some more amps into the system and bring the voltage back up but it does it in about a tenth of a second. When you turn something off, the alternator is still pumping all these electrons into the system. The voltage will go a little too high. The voltage regulator reads that, oh, it's not at 14, it's at 14.2. It'll tell the alternator, pump a little less electrons into the system, and the voltage will come back down to 14, or you could describe it as the pressure will come back down. Again, it's going to do this in less than a tenth of a second. So think about that for a moment. Every time you turn something electrical on, this is with the alternator on and running, every time you turn something electrical on and ever, or every time you turn something electrical off, the pressure, the voltage is going to vary just a little bit, and the regulator is going to tell the alternator, put out more amps or less. That's what's happening under normal conditions. So if we wanted to say, okay, I want to troubleshoot this electrical system with a lead acid battery, you need to understand the battery, you need to understand ground, that everything connected to ground is touching, you need to understand that the bus bar is connected to the positive side of the battery, you need to connect, you need to understand that the voltage regulator is to either put out more amps or put out less amps, you need to know that the alternator needs to produce one or two or three more volts than the battery is so it'll charge the battery. You need to understand that if everything's working correctly and you don't turn on too much stuff, the alternator will produce all the power for all the components and enough power to charge the battery. And the only time, if everything's working right, the only time that this isn't going to work is either the alternate, something breaks or you turn on so many things that the alternator can't handle it. And here's why that almost never happens. If you are, anybody in here going to grow up and be an airplane mechanic, helicopter mechanic? How many people are going to become a mechanic, but you're not planning on growing up? All right, okay. John, I believe you. So, there is an FAA regulation about if you're going to install more electrical equipment on an aircraft, you have to look at all the electrical stuff, and you're going to pretend, hmm, if I was in flight and everything was running correctly, and I turned on every single electrical component in the aircraft, the landing lights, the radios, the navigation lights, the strobe lights, the stereo, the jacuzzi pump, you turn on everything that's available, that's not supposed to be more than 80% of what the alternator can put out. That way, if whoever's operating the aircraft in flight, let's say it's at night, the pitot heat, there's a tube that air comes in to measure airspeed, and when you fly in the clouds, you may get ice on it and clog it up, so there's a heating element in it. That takes electrical power. So you make an assumption that you turn on everything, so you can calculate all of that and add it all up, and if it adds up to more than 80%, you can't put that thing in there. Unless you put a placard 
on the ammeter that says, I think, it, I think the FAA exact verbiage says something like, yo, 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 pilot, don't turn everything on or it will be bad. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the verbiage is, but it's something like, I personally like the yo, yo, yo. Is there a comma after each yo? Or is it just yo, yo, yo with no commas? Jonah, you think there's no commas? You, have you ever written down the words yo, yo, yo? Okay, back in the 90s, I know some of you were there. When you were three years, there was, an, there was a TV show on MTV called Yo MTV Raps. That was the name of a television show on cable TV. You've probably not heard of it, but MTV used to be actually a music channel, not a reality TV show channel. They used to just show music videos. It was actually worth watching. And then they started with reality programs. Well, I think they started with maybe Yo, I think Yo, Yo MTV Raps was the beginning of the end for MTV. But we're not going to talk about cable television anymore today. Maybe a little more tomorrow. So let's see. So if you were going to diagnose this system, if you were going to troubleshoot it, you would have to know about the battery, yeah, all the components, the battery, the voltage regulator, the alternator, and then everything that hooks all this stuff up together. So the main components, you're going to say, well, it's the battery and the voltage regulator and the alternator. That's true. But it could also be the connections. I mentioned that several days ago. The electrical connections in each of these components, in particular the battery, they could be having too high of a resistance and not letting electrons in or out of that component. So it's not just saying, OK, it's got to be the, it's not working right. It's got to be the battery, the alternator, or the voltage regulator. No. Those components could be working correctly, but it might be the electrical connections at each component. It could be one of the cables, one of the wires is bad. And I haven't drawn it in this picture, but you're actually going to see. There's actually a switch on the voltage regulator. That switch right there, they usually call that the alternator switch. In your car, when you put the key in and you turn it to on, even if you don't start it, that actually closes that switch and makes it go on. It also closes this switch. But in most aircraft that have DC power systems, there's one switch is the electrical master that connects the battery to the bus bar, and then a separate switch that connects the alt that turns the volt connects the voltage regulator to the bus bar, and it's usually labeled alternator or generator. And a lot of aircraft they put these two switches right together because 99.9% .9 of the time you have both of them on at the same time. And 99.99% .99 of the time, the pilot who's operating the aircraft has both of them on at the same time. So, Friedrich, name one component that you would have to understand in order to troubleshoot a lead-acid battery charging system in an aircraft. Just one. The alternator, name another one. The voltage regulator. What's another component? We're getting hard now. We got we got alternator, we got voltage regulator. What's a component that you would need to understand to be able to troubleshoot this? <coughs> the ammeter, I'll have to accept the ammeter. Yeah, you would need to know that what the ammeter is gonna do or should be doing. Dominic. Can you name a component in this system? to have to have some basic understanding of in order to be able to troubleshoot it if something was wrong. We've got alternator, voltage regulator, ammeter. The bus system, yeah, we got to have this whole electrical bus bar. I'll, I accept that. Leo. The battery score. That was I knew someone sooner or later would take the battery. Can you think of one more, Jose? 
I can think of two more. It's okay. The stuff that what? The stuff that's in there, yes. Can you name one of the things, the stuff that's in there? Are you talking about the things that say stuff over on the side? Okay, uh, Leo just said you need to understand the bus bar. It's okay, he's a long way away. You were distracted. I can tell you're taking lots of notes, so. Is it okay if I harass you a little bit? Okay. Whatever's in, you're talking about the thing that says stuff and more stuff? Yeah, uh, Jose is bringing up a very good point. If you don't know how many amps it, there are when you turn these things on, if you don't know what the amperage that they're going to need, you might not be able to figure out what's going on. Marco, can you name another thing that you would need to understand how it works to be able to troubleshoot this? What, Nate, look at that and tell me, what's another component that we have not mentioned? And when I say component, I mean anything that's on there. The wires. The wires. Thank you, Marco. I was waiting for that one. Yeah, you need to understand how wires work. So, for instance, Jason, we haven't talked about it a lot. Tell me about electricity and wires. What do you know? A three-page paper. I, I expect it on my desk by noon today. Yeah, so the resistance of the wire might be too high. The connections at the terminals might be bad. Ashton, can you name an additional component that's up here that you need to understand before you can do a really good job troubleshooting? So, what do you mean? Which components that we haven't discussed yet? I'll give you a hint. There's an electrical symbol up there for something that no one has mentioned in the last four minutes. As soon as you tell me the right answer with no one helping you, then we will dismiss class. I'll give you a hint. It's an electrical symbol at the bottom of the screen, and there's more than one. What is it? You can't see? Wow. You, so I guess we're going to stay here forever. You want to? Let's see. Uh, James? Score. Can you help him out? The ground. we got to understand how the ground works and everything's connected to the ground. Class is dismissed. Hi, Amir. How are you? Hang on. Just give me one moment. Let's see. I want to save that. And then just give me 30 more seconds here. And I hit 